Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the episode just before the 70th episode of the Mad Axman podcast. Of course, there's a full set of seven this week. Lockdown hasn't ended and we're not all running through the fields. Possibly those fields are weak with them great abandoned playing soldiers. This week we talk about painting tartan. There's a bit about Danish infantry. Hobbits get a look in. We also actually look at O Group, a proper set of rules that's been released this week. There's a discussion, of course, about selling rats on eBay. We talk about the ADLG basing, water slide transfers. And also we have, I'm sorry I think you're an ass with Adam going full bore, full on, before we finally stagger into Andy's quiz and then into our wrap-up of all the usual painting and gaming nonsense. Enjoy the podcast. Well, welcome to... I think this is 69, actually, a um, little bit disturbing, but we, we creep ever closer towards 100, although the lockdown creeps ever closer towards not actually being um, in effect, really. So strangely enough, it is a Zoom screen. There are seven people here all staring at me, um, although slightly oddly again, I'm one of those seven people. But without further ado, we will start in our traditional way and ask that question of what have you been kind of up to on the painting table this week? And let's start this time with Mr. Saunders up in that top corner as you are looking into your um, electron magneto microscope um, or or kind of very big magnifying glass, possibly trying to set something on fire. And um, what what have you, oh, you're waving brushes at me as well. What what have you been painting up in Harrow? Um, It's now the, hang on, I can remember, Danish Guard de Wut. No, that's the Guard. This You're not the, saying the pronunciation's wrong, are you, Dave? I think we've had a pastry. thing about that. Uh, anyway, these, these are um, Danish guards, so they're little cream jackets. Okay. Cream yeah. yellow jackets with... Uh, you, didn't, you didn't go for butternut as the colour this time? Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've almost finished ten six-packs, just on the last two. Then two lots of four cavalry to be done. And some Scotsmen. I'm not sure about the Scotsmen. I've never painted Scotsmen before. I think a lot of people are not sure about Scotsmen, but that's um, that's probably a different podcast, I suspect. So, <laughs> so how much of this army have you actually got completed then? You know, is there a percentage for how far through you are at it? Or three, three quarters. Of, I mean, I've got some basing, sands, putting on the base, that sort of thing to do, blocking and stuff. So I, I, I'd say three. I mean, you know, I've, I've broken the back of it. I've done eight of the six, uh, eight, eight of the ten six packs. I've done two lots of cavalry and four bases, and some two lots of six Scotsmen to do. So most of it's done. Quite, I've quite enjoyed it. It's been a, it's been an interesting, different learning curve mm-hmm. figures I've never seen before. Period I've never done before. Yeah. Okay. And um, <clears throat> was was there anything particular? Because we've talked about frilly cuffs and collars, and then we've talked about the pronunciation of boing, and and then we we had another discussion about another battle, whatever it was called last week. But um, okay. any any more research amongst your Danes, or have you did you do that all before, and it's just all been sort of rushing uh, downhill? It's, it's the research has all been done before. So uh, most of it in in sort of a light grey jacket, but. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's a couple of weird units in blue and orange and this one which is just doing which is, yeah, the sort of pale yellow and red cuffs. So they, they, they look good. <laughs> the thing is, when you look down on them, they all look like mushrooms because they've all got these stupid big floppy hats on. Right. <laughs> you can't really see the detail. When you sort of look at the army on a table, it's like lots of hats. All right. It could be hordes of the thing, mushroom army or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 100%. And is, is there a chance to do the Scotsman with any tartan at all, or are they um, not that uh, type? Of, they're not skirt wearing Scotsman. No, well, they're not. They're not. I don't actually. I don't know actually. Uh, that's a good question. Hold on a minute. Let's have a look. I think they're all, they've got bonnets. I've been having a discussion with my uh, clients today about what colour the bonnet should be, because I've looked at Gordon's Scotsman before, and they were all. Uh, they all little shades of blue, isn't that sort of they what they normally look, are? They look like Smurfs because they were all in little pale blue bonnets and they just looked a bit strange, to be mm. honest. <laughs> I guess they're probably Lowland Scots because of the religion and, and the, the fact that the Jacobite Rebellion, it took place in 1715 and later on were Highland Scots. 
Well, my, my client tells me that, uh, what's it called? Not Montrose, the, anyway, it's the, got that period. Dundee. Of, uh, for Covent, Covenanters. Covenanters was over by this period. So yeah. the bonnet, I mean, I think we're, we're talking about having a mixture of bonnet colours, which make it, uh, these guys have got, they've got little sort of like cloaks. Okay. That sounds like, like a great them. opportunity for Tartan. If they've got cloaks, you can't resist, can you? Surely. Well, exactly. That's that's going to be the, the tartan bit. I think the rest of it. Yeah. So there, there's two six packs of Lowlands Scotland. So one's going to be fairly regimented and sort of more in uniform. The other one's going to be a bit, bit, bit more irregular, a bit more auxiliary. Mm. Uh, have, have you done Have you done tartan before? No, never. Right. There's. I think. Well, I, I I've done it myself and surprised myself about how effective it is because there's sort of a trick um about making it slightly easier than you think because you're just getting the scale yeah get out someone else to paint it get someone else to paint it that's one of the tricks but tamsin i'm guessing is this one of the things that you've i've only done tartan once not right. on a 38 mil figure okay all right so um right. these cloaks is paint them green mm. and then do a sort of a, a linen and a red stripe across them and then just put dots across to turn it into a you know to pattern it to checkerboard it i think yeah no i because when i've done it it's what you well what i did was it isn't really a proper tartan color but it looks like one when you're looking at a 15 or 20 odd mil figure so you do the dark green background yeah. then you do kind of a fairly broad um not checkerboard but just st stripes that cross each other um, with one colour, like a, a pale blue or, or a yellow or something like that. And then inside that, the, the big broad stripes, you just do a thin stripe of, of red or, or a different colour. So you're not actually doing a proper tartan. It's green background, then a kind of grid, a fat grid. Maybe that's the thing in yeah, one colour and then a, a thin line in the middle of the, the grid on the other one. And it it does actually work. I think I, I found it online somewhere as a suggestion and it's it's one of those kind of it tricks the eye but doing things hyper realistic at super small scale is never it is, isn't really necessary it's it's easier than it looks I, that's that's definitely my plan is to uh yeah paint the cloak a, a dark sheet and do a thin yellow a yellow stripe mm. Like, sure, I've, got, I've got a sneaking feeling i might have even put a diagram on my website somewhere i have to i have to see if i can remember that look it out and put a link to it somewhere or something like that. So, so I, you got... video, I videos that you can make that you can get an idea from. Um, Kujo's Painting Academy. That's K U J O apostrophe S on YouTube. If you look at Kujo's website, actually, I'm, yeah, I've been watching them on YouTube. They're actually quite good. A big shout for Mr. Kujo. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's, they do a special Scottish edition or something like that. <laughs> I've as at least I've as at least what I one video on there where he's doing tartan. Okay. Check him out. No, Check he, him out. His, his site's quite his uh, YouTube channel's not bad actually. It's quite useful. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let, let's carry on going around then. Um, Tamsin, what, what have you? Um, you were doing. You did faces and hands last time. Which which part of American Civil War soldiers' anatomy have you? Um, been mass producing this week yeah well i uh, fi finished the union union cavalry well finished painting mm -hmm. so, yeah that's quite uh, a lot of them i can see that yeah and i've started now on the confederate cavalry 90 cavalry and 15 for generals bases so it's going to be quite a um a clash at brandy wine station isn't it really yeah with all of those what well, brandy station brandy station sorry wrong one yeah, yeah. brandy brandy wine i know they're small but these aren't hobbits right it, yeah look it's all a blur isn't it it's um yeah it's so all brandy, made up what was the brandy wine that was in the war of independence oh <laughs> of new yeah. zealand was it or no 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 in, in, in america in 1770 something okay all right uh, so, so with the confederate cavalry so far i've got most of the work on the horses done uh, just need to do the bridles and the sort of saddle saddle blankets. Mm. Have you got someone with shotguns? 
six mil. This is um, six mil, Andy. Yeah. Either troopers have got sabers. Yeah, out. They're, right. they're lucky to be armed with heads sometimes, yeah. or arms possibly. I'm only asking. You're not being critical. No. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, I'm trying to remember. You've got infantry to do these. Um, to go with these already, have you, or somewhere? Yeah, I've got. I've got some infantry, some cavalry, some artillery, and generals already. But they just needed some more cavalry. Okay. And then in your world of of not being unfaithful to one project a week, you do count um, dallying with preparation. Yeah, as, I've done a little um, not bit. technically I've being unfaithful. I've, I've done a bit of prep, a bit more prep on the on the US powers. So is that prep like you know the, the basic not six the, colours or something? The, yeah. clean, the clean up. Oh right, okay. Cleaning do you do, do you do you have like a special thing that you buy at Wilkinson's that you clean them up with, or is it just? Oh no, no. This is for sort of the cleaning off mold mold lines, smoothing that, like, sort of grinding out okay. the bases a bit at that stage. And there's no special, you know, ion-powered vortex blaster no, no. that you use to send I, them down. It's just the blade well, of a knife. Once I've, done all, once I've done all the filing, filing, scraping, so they just go into the, into the tub with some hot washing up water. Okay, just get all the different bits and pieces over. Yeah. So a fairly straightforward week for you then as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Although I would have got a bit of paint. Don't get any painting done today because I got distracted by the by. Read it, reading my PDF of O Group. Yes, no, that that came through for me as well. The um the PDF of that. Um, yeah. so have you? Did you get a chance to properly digest any of it? Or well, I obviously, a, if it distracts you from just to get an idea of what what I need, and uh, now it's thinking about what scale to do it in. I guess. what is O Group? I'm always tempted. I guess, ground scale is two millimeter. <laughs> two millimeter. No, that would look very weird. Very, very uh, weird. What, what is O Group? Mil. Oh, O Group. Um, o Group is the new, um, what is it, so battalion level? Yeah. Well, well, each each battalion set. supports level. It's David David C. R. Brown who did General De Brigade. Is it General De Brigade? Um, yeah. And the Civil War one as well he did as well. Uh, yeah. Gone to Gettysburg, I think it's called. Yeah, that's the one. And it's yeah. it's a, it's produced by two fat lardies and it's been getting some um quite a lot of online love um in advance so it's quite a lot of people excited by it but it just seems to be a a second world war set that's driven by command and control rather than driven by rivet counting and, and ranges and numbers which is is kind of neat um i don't know i think i i will not, not i think i will um hope to try to major on it in 15 mil because I've got a lot of 15 mil stuff based for Peter Pig's um, poor bloody infantry rules, which is little sections of three on on a base. And I think O Group looks like it does have that sort of structure as well. So so using all these 15 mil things, but but it does make me start you, thinking. You've got, you got 10, 12 mil for... Well, I do as well, BKC. yeah. Yeah, 10 mil, 12 mil for, for BKC, and I could use that as well, I'm sure. Um, depending on giving it a go, but it's just thinking: Can I get these 15s out of the drawer? Because it's been a long time since I played PBI, and um, and there's some really, really nice ones in there. So, was well, there anything else that kind of jumped out from you from from a skim through the rules? Um, not much. I just looking through. If I... You're looking at shopping, uh, really. Yeah, just thinking that, and also sort of thinking, wondering. So when I'll have a few more army lists up somewhere. Yeah, although I suppose at that sort of level of organisation, it's not too difficult to, um, yeah. you know, bash it together from tables of organisation. I, I wonder how close they are to some of the old Flames of War books, because they always had tables of organisation and stuff in them as well. Yeah. Possibly. They're probably not too difficult, to be honest. Yeah, probably doable. No, but I think it looks interesting. I've got it. I've got a couple of days where I'm going to take the PDF on my um, on my iPad and kind of read through it over the next couple of days. So maybe have more of a view on it next time we gather in in a week or so's time. Um, okay, Andy, did you um, receive yours as well? Did you order? Yeah, I've, down, I've, down, I've downloaded mine today. I've I've just started reading through it. I haven't got very far with it because I've been working, but. I watched some of the um, Lardy videos on how to play it, and they seem quite instructive. And if you've looked at those, when you read the rules, or the little bits I read so far, it seems to hang together quite well. 
Um, yeah, I, I saw some of those videos as well. They were good, weren't they? And yeah. You, I thought it was really interesting the way the video started with um, command and control and objectives. And then it was, I think it was like the fourth video before they got onto the mechanics of firing and movement. Yeah. That, that just wasn't important or, you know, as important in the rules, which I thought was kind of neat, um, just even as a matter of principle. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'm, I think my my major doubt with most World War Two games is how much terrain do you need to make it look realistic and work properly, um, and how I don't know how big the table needs to be. I'll probably end up fiddling the size of the table too because the amount of space I've got available, and the fact I've got ten mil, so I might like convert inches to centimeters or something. But uh, yeah. I'd be interested to give it a go. Look the table works out either I group about one mile square. Yeah, but it's eighteen hundred um, by twelve hundred yards. So, yeah, well, I, I, I might, I will see. But uh, it, it certainly, from, from what I saw in the, in, you know, advertising blurb and then the videos and that, it looked quite interesting. And I thought, well, I didn't need to buy an awful lot of kit to to, to make it work. So, um, I'll, I'll give it a punt. I, I did wonder as well. I think there's, well, there is because I found it. There's a lot of stuff on Tabletop Simulator for. Um, bolt action and um, flames of war, lots of little rendered models and, and terrain. There's some huge, huge terrain chain, layouts. Chain of command as well. For, for chain of command as well. Yeah, that's true. And um, it, whether it would be possible to actually run through some of those rules on TTS before yeah, we were allowed is. to actually meet up and, um, and kind yeah. of do it virtually because all the stuff's there already to give that a punt. Um, yes, it sounds like it probably doable you know give it yeah. about two or three weeks to read through the rules and wrap our heads around it and then maybe yeah. give it a go online yeah maybe have a group um group tabletop yeah. simulator play around on um shove yeah. some shove some little soldiers around on, indeed yeah on the virtual tabletop so this means war Andy, have you um have you done your skeletons yet? Um, the, the thing that was going to take you months, but suddenly seems to take less time. Yeah, I'm, I, I've finished all the infantry and cavalry. Um, I'm now painting. What else is the... there? <laughs> well, I, I hesitate to ask. Well, I, I, did, I, I did. I did six chariots. I'm now ah, painting chariot. up. I'm now painting up the flyers, the monsters, the artillery, and the um, and then they'll just be the leaders, and that's it. So, I reckon talking two maybe three weeks depending on how how much time i get to paint but at the moment i'm at what i'm doing this evening i'm just doing a massive undercoating job on pretty well everything that's left uh, what, which what kind is, of monsters does a skeleton army have other than just well it's got great it's skeletons. got it's got giants oh, sorry, skeletons oh, skeleton dragons well oh, it's, 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 it's got, got all of them the, they've got, got the full dragon. set which could be like Apart a from the vehicle. jellyfish. Doesn't have jellyfish. Yeah. Or no, doesn't no have jellyfish. jellyfish. No, but it's got got a bone giant. They look pretty horrible. And a sphinx. And a sphinx. Elephant. Yeah, and it's got an, it's got a heavy artillery thing that fires skulls. Well, you would do. You'd have quite a lot of them lying around, wouldn't you? I guess. Although I suppose your soldiers would get a little bit irritated if they um if they fell asleep next to the pile of missiles. Well, yeah, yeah right, kind of right, ready right, use right. ammunition. Yeah. Yeah, um, they could get flinged over there. <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, the flying the flying stuff is vultures. So uh, I've got six six of those, so I can make about two or three units. Yeah, out do of they it. attack people, or are they actually for transport for um for picking up some of the no, skeletons they fly over and people, taking them? They, no, they fly over people and poo on them. I think that's what they do. I, I, right. Well, obviously, yeah. That, that's yeah. I, I should have I should have realised that. Okay, so have actually, you picked no, that's up any... the seagulls, not, not, not the vultures. I'm getting yeah. messed up. Sorry. Have, have you picked up any more um, skeleton? painting tips over the last week or so or is it has it just been the production line has been in full effect uh, kind of production line really um it, it's um i mean i did I, I did what i i did slightly change my technique in the sense that i did the um bone uh main color well under undercoat and gray i always undercoat and gray primer because it means i can see what i'm painting and it also means that if you're painting a light color you don't have to do too many extra coats on it um then then paint paint the main lot bone, then put the uh, inky, what do you call it, the army painter brown tone on it, mm. and then kind of dry brush over over it with, with bone again, and that's it, apart from any bits you want to colour, like um, headgear or, you know, bows and you know, arrow points and things like that. And because they're such small figures, 
the metally bits I'm using in silver rather than a metal because uh, it just shows up a bit better. Okay. And um, if I'm remembering right, um, these are going to fight an army of yours, Simon, aren't they? Um, have you, are you the, one, the other one with some 10 mil fantasy stuff that's going to be taking these guys on? Yeah, I've got the 10 mil, 10 mil dwarves. So it seems like a natural reaction. Bones versus guys with big hammers. What could possibly go wrong there? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You, do, you, you, also, you also have your mammoth with, with, with artillery. Yeah, so I've got the... Um, and berserkers. I mean, not that yeah. berserkers are going to scare the undead very much, but... It was one of those army purchases where you look at the, the, the ranges and you think, I have no need for that model, but it's a mammoth that you can put different infantry on top of it on the platform, so I've put a whole bunch of dwarf uh, crossbows on it just to give the idea of, you know, woolly mammoth, you know, impact elephant, lots of shooting as well. just seems appropriate for a dwarf army. Yeah. No, but I, I think I, I think it was Neve suggested to put the bloke with the sword on the top, wave it. Yeah. Wave. Yeah. So, Simon, you painted, um, I think, what, six figures last week or something, um, something shameful. But um, what mm -hmm. have you have you just kept in the funk or, or has, has there been a bounce back, an Australian style recovery? Yeah, it has been. So I've finally managed not to, be, not to work 14 hours a day for the last week. So that's made a bit of a change. Um, so this this week I managed to get uh, three, base, three bases of winged hazards painted up. So I've got some of the... The Lancashire model uh, wing hazards. I'm going to use them for the army, for the poles. You can have a couple of these um, levy units that are masquerading as wing hazards. You've got fake wing hazards, so they're uh, slightly different troops. And then I got busy and painted up the last of the Ottoman Turks. So I've got the um, city rabble uh, now painted up. So oh, wow. I'm a okay. big base for them. Yeah. And just to have something completely different, I painted up another um, one of the big rat vehicles for my uh, Rampage Dragon Army. So it's a it's a, it's a 25 mil model of a big wheel with a rat inside it, driving it, with a whole bunch of little rats actually powering the wheel because they're moving around like a, like a flywheel. And you've got a rat on the back of it, uh, sort of hitting a hammer on something to try and get the guns to fire. And then you've got like side chariot effects with you know prongs and forks and all that. So really appropriate. So that might be like something like a war wagon. <laughs> who who actually makes that then? The crazy rat wheeled wagon thing. It's one of the um, the Games Workshop Skaven range. So they have okay. um, a whole bunch of these random stupid vehicles that are um, completely implausible. But you've got to have one. So I've got three. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Def. Do they come in a pack of three? Um, is that you know the way Games Workshop bumps its profits up or? Oh no, it definitely comes in a pack of one. But um, it was one of those eBay purchases where um, you look at what you could you could buy, you could see the inventory, and there was one vehicle. And then when the box arrived, this guy had obviously just cleared out his cupboard, and put everything David into one box. Like, ooh, I've got six vehicles. I don't need those three. They're going back on eBay. I'll keep those other three. So oh, happy days. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. So, did you actually end up making a profit on that sale? Then, did you did you yeah, sell the three for what you bought the wrong? The other three vehicles basically paid for the rest of the army, so I was rather happy with that. No, that's fantastic. That's doing a bit yeah, of profit cost trading. Neutral. Yay. That's good. Okay, so so it's been kind of finishing up the Ottomans. They're they're now done and in the box and awaiting. And yep. so, is there anything else that started in the pile, or has it just been um, doing the hazards? So the the one that started now is I started looking at the um, Alexander the Great and the Hoplites, looking mm. at um, how, before I paint them, just looking to see how I can base them up. So playing with the idea of, especially with the um, Alexander the Greek, the pikemen, whether I want to have 12 or 16 on a base or just, you know, 9 or 12, just to you know, give that nice effect of pike, but you also don't want to have too crowded that you lose half the point of the detail of museum miniatures. Yeah, no, I, I'm a big fan of 12, three ranks of four, because you they're all going to be next to each other, so you do want them all to be shoulder to shoulder. If you Isn't the common. next um, version of the rules just three ranks of four anyway? Well, I think the next version sounds like it's going to have the, um, the one UD square base for Pike will be the default rather than the option that we suggest you do. Hmm, and the okay. three um dbm base of pike will be the option rather than the the default so you know it, it won't actually change for what you can actually use if you want yeah. to but but just the, i think the um the waiting in 
is probably going to change just to just to be more to one UD square and stick them on that thing. I've been basing a lot of my new armies on one UD squares for the main infantry and mounted anyway, because it's a you can buy those big bags of you know 40 mil square bases, you buy 200 of them at one one big hit, especially with some of the um some miniatures where especially like the Lancashire models, their pike and all that are a little bit fragile. Having a bigger base means you can you can protect them a little bit more. Where some some ranges like your museum or Essex, the pike are pretty tolerant of, of quite a bit of abuse. So mm -hmm. um, but having a 40 mil base just makes life easier because then it just you don't have to worry about 40 or 30. You just wheel, turn, one UD square. There you go. And uh, all, all, all my pikes been on 40 by 40 for quite some time. I I think I've only got a handful of bases left where they're not um, mm. they're not based up like that. And and 12 is is the best you can fit more on but then you're starting to have to do um four three four three yeah and and they look a little bit um a bit more of a rabble uh, which which works for some but i think for the drilled greeks and the yeah. swiss you just kind of want a bit more yeah i did that for my um some of my medieval armies where i've got like the, the foot knights because they were a little bit rabbleish yeah. they weren't properly lined up so you might have uh, a row of four at the front, then three knights behind, then four at the back. So it gives you that visual of, yep, that's definitely heavy, uh, you know, a foot knight, but they're not all neatly lined up to say like our um, Roman legionnaires who were well drilled, all formation, yeah. proper off we go. I must admit, I've been, um, I've, I've been doing a lot of rebasing this week. It's been kind of a, a halfway between prep and finishing stuff. Um, you mentioned about those big bags of bases. I did order, I think, 180 40 by 30 bases from Ben Dragon. Well. <laughs> and they, it just feels like they've nearly gone. Um, mm. I don't quite understand how that's happened, but but it's probably rebasing up all of my Russ and Vikings, um, which was like probably mm, about 50 talking. of them. Um, and then redoing all these hoplites. And then I've just started to rebase some of my medievals as well. So... So again, I rebase some pole arm guys with four at the front and three at the back because you kind of need a bit of space to swing a big axe on the end of a pole, really, don't you? So, how was it cutting out all the little shields and that? Because um, you were printing them out and um, redoing it yeah, for the hoplites. Um, yeah, didn't really it get a bit got, frustrating after a bit? Um, I really got onto a roll with it actually because what I've done, I've I've done um, about a dozen bases of hoplites now with eight hoplites to a thing and um and what i found is doing them as water slide transfers is so much easier than than doing lbms ones because water slide you're actually cutting okay it's a pain in the ass to cut round a tiny little shield transfer but you are still cutting paper whereas the lbms ones have got that plastic film over it that makes them quite difficult to cut easily certainly in a circle so but with um with water slide paper it's just easy to cut because it's as i say it's just simply paper and then you drop them in the water it's like an airfix transfer or whatever they would be um sl and they slide off and they're easier to maneuver because again with the lbms ones you've got to put them in the right place because they're fucking st well they're stuck they're just stuck once they're on Whereas these ones, you can slide them about a bit for a while with your microsol and your microset and um, and reposition them. And so I printed off way, way more than um, I needed. You know, you just you copy the image onto a page a load of times and, and you do an A4 sheet at a time. And because it makes such a difference to the figures, you are achieving quite a lot, um, quite quite quickly, <laughs> really. So... So all of these hoplites, it's debase all my old hoplites, leave them standing in water, peel them off the old bases, um, scrape off the, the paint that was on their shields, just their shields, and um, then paint them white, then do another coat of white, then do some gloss varnish, and then you start dropping these water slide transfers on. But, but I just got into a zone of cutting round these little water slide transfers, and, and I ended up with a bag of them. So I've, I've still got, you know, I... I obviously didn't count when I was doing it. I just kept going. And it looks like I've probably got about 30 or 40 more than I actually need already cut out as well, which is um which probably means I'll have to buy some more hot lights or something. But um <laughs> but 
but also then there's a you know my broom head has now taken a bit of a battering and um and a lot of the bristles are now firmly attached to to the hop lights they've a lot of them have got green um <laughs> green spears at the moment waiting for me to paint them up but um but the overall effect once you start basing the damn things up is is really really good um particularly compared to the terrible painted hand painted shields that were 25 years old that i had before so it just suddenly feels like i've made a a real difference to um to this army and really really dragged up the the quality of them just by by doing that kind of cheaty wargamer thing of concentrate on the bits that people see which is which is the shields and a row of nice shields and shiny um you know helmets so, and stuff on top so the, the yeah. limus test is are you going to take a greek hoplite army to um a competition then i think so you know well what you know there's been a podcast about it and and it's not that bad and and they do look decent we did and i think also once we're down at the club again which is is almost in touching distance it will be easy to take armies and go right i you know come down and have two games in a day and give them two different runs out and stuff like that and get all these different armies on the table but but yeah so there's there's loads and loads of these hot lights i'm just doing the second um second batch at the moment and i'm <coughs> i'm kind of thinking do i um because normally i matte varnish everything but because these have already been done once they've sort of been matte varnished and you know in a block of eight they don't quite get as much handling as well um you know, in, in adlg you know they're, they're not going to wear off they've got plastic um spears now so they're not going to flake or or whatever as much as as they did when they were the s6 spaghetti stuff so i'm i'm kind of thinking do i actually go over some of the helmets with a new fresh bronze or brass or whatever a bit of a mix and give them um so to speak so we're talking about two fat lardies rules um shiny helmets and possibly even leave some of the shields as shiny as well you know um and i'm because it's kind of would some of the shields have been more metallic -y and and shiny should i do that and, and have a mix of matte and gloss shields well would, this, would the shields have been um metallic or would they have been wooden in those days i i don't know the answer well some some of them are painted no, wouldn't i with with and I with a, a thin covering. metal boss or something probably, but yeah. yeah. No, hop light shields were covered in bronze. I think some of them are. Yeah, because some must of them been heavy to carry. Yeah, I think it was like a really thin bit, but I suppose if you're hop light, that's it. But so some of them um, have got, you know, it's it's sort of a yellow shield, but it's a yellow goldy color. So I might leave those as um, gloss because then they look a bit more metallic. As, as the color but the one of the weird things though about doing all these different shield designs um first of all there's a lot of them with this mad grinning face um that you can't quite see but there's a lot of those which look like a lunatic and then the other thing that struck me is there's some um, there's quite a few with doves on them that's a fairly common design in all the stuff that i've got scalped from online and i was thinking i'm putting them on thinking that that's fine and at what point you know does some greek bloke go here steve um, isn't the dove like the universal symbol of peace? What what are we doing with this on the front of our shields here? Is this uh, is it like a secret surrender? You know, well, where, where, where do you think the phrase "make peace, not war" came from? Well, um, probably not from not from my fifteen mil hoplites, but but it's just surely someone would not put a dove on um, on the front oh, of their shield. The it, it might be the emblem of a particular goddess of some city or something. Now. I know I'm thinking that, yeah, but... Yeah, but was it a universal symbol of peace then? But it's the dove and the olive branch. It's got to be kind of Greek, hasn't it? That's yeah, they were just trying to send a message, though, by carrier pigeon. Yeah. Have this shield <laughs> boss in your face. Yeah, <laughs> it could be, and have a bit of this shield with you. But um, really so with you, sir. There's some of these, and then there's some really nice ones with all sorts of other odds and sods in it. So they look really, really eclectic and really different. So... So it's been very pleasing, but it's such a multi-step process. Scrape the thing off, paint it white, paint it white again, put gloss on it, put a layer of microset, then well, slide the transfer on. Then Tim, put, a layer, oh. put it in the way. If it wasn't for the pandemic, would you have done it? No, God no, no. Pandemic and um, and early retirement has um, 
has absolutely motivated me to do this. But it's, you know, I, I have been thinking about replacing these for a while and I had done some of them, but but to actually kind of blitz through the whole lot and then think once I've done 18 of them, that still gives me about another 10 or something that I can probably sell off and just create a bit of space, which will be kind of kind of decent. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've done some pavises as well, making pavises for some, um, um, what are they, um, what are they called? The Teutonic, Teutonic, yeah, Teutonic crossbowmen. So, um, pr again, printing off some pavise pictures of actual real pavises and then mounting them on sort of thin card or, or reasonably robust card and, and sticking them in front of some crossbowmen to come up with these really very Teutonic kind of crossbow pavise units because I'm, I'm still getting more and more into the idea of having different pavises. And then the other bit that has been super prep has been going through all of my old Merliton 15 mil communal Italian infantry and dunking them all in the bio strip. And it was like two different tubs worth of, or two different batches to kind of trim all them or, you know, strip all those down and, um, and get them all back to bare metal. So I think yesterday I stuck um, plastic spears or plastic broom brussels on 90 spearmen um of different types pre um pre undercoating and then suddenly i'm kind of thinking i've got about four different armies on the go that are all able to be undercoated at the same time which um i'm not sure that's a good thing i am going to, have to actually start painting something i've just gone kind of prep crazy really i've been rebasing and prepping and i've not actually done any real painting for an awful long time but um but other than that it's been kind of it still feels productive because I'm I'm getting close to having a lot of units very very quickly that look a lot better than they did um, a while ago, but but no, it's been so yeah it's been successful from that point of view and um, but without actually doing much much painting of stuff. But uh, so kind of basically, you've been doing a unit sprinkling. Yeah, I've been doing kind of a unit tarting up kind of thing. Um, maybe it's maybe it's thinking about events coming up and thinking. I want to get some stuff that I can put on table because it now feels almost touchable. But um, so this means you're going to take Russ to the step competition, is it? <laughs> yeah, that would be a challenge, wouldn't it? That would be a challenge for everybody. But I mean, it may be. Maybe, maybe drop them on there. Um, this but, means war. Going going round the um, round the thing, Adam. I think did I see you earlier on with some instructions in front of you? Were you? Were you does that mean you're making tiny ships again? Has it come round to that time of year? Yeah, it wasn't instructing. It was um, the ships come with sort of like a bit of a printout, giving a little bit of information on the ship. So I'm I'm just starting to prep them up to do them next. But I've had quite a an exciting week because although I can't claim to have finished the um, old Dave can't yeah. claim to have finished the dashing army. Um, I've done all the fur. I had two bags, 120 worth of victory dashings, and they are now done. I put the final matte coat varnish on today. Um, which is 120 very... 25 mil figures that you've made from plastic scratch, yeah. Um, oh, which look at the bag that was. Um, well, I've only done 118 actually, there are two left over for only German, <laughs> Germans. But I had a bit of a, well, it wasn't a nightmare, but a bit of an annoyance. Because the bit I like most in doing figures, and it's my favourite bit of doing figures, is when I stick the magna base onto the bottom of the base, because that's the very last thing I do. So I like it the most because that means it's done. It's beautiful. Um, so um, I, because the last three batches I finished off together because I did all the shields together. And field shield transfers, once you've got a little system going, it's surprisingly quick. I thought it would take ages and be really fiddly, but once I'd got the system going, it was bang, 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 thank you very much. So that was good. And I've based them all, all up this week, and the last thing I had to do today is after bringing them in from outside, because we've had lovely weather, is put the magna base on. I put the magna base on, and I was just so pleased because it's, like, done. And I was putting them in the box with this sort of, like, metal sheet on the bottom so they could go, go into storage. And I was thinking... That's weird. They're not sticking. And oh. the magnet base 
I actually cut out and stuck on was um, Metal Sheet. Oh, which was, rubberized Metal Sheet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that which was good, isn't it? Which was annoying. I mean, it's not a nightmare because it, it, it only takes five minutes to do and it took less than five minutes to peel it back off back off again and then stick them all on again. So I got to do the magnet base twice. So that might have been a good thing because it's my favourite bit I got to do twice. Um, so that was a bit, a bit of a thing. But now for that army, all I've got left to do is those four calves that you sent me mm. and they've been underbased. And they're ready. When you Have you painted yours up yet as ghouls? Not yet, no, not yet. Because... They seem really big. Are they warlord? No, no, they're um, Victrix. Victrix. Because they Victrix seem really big. Got, so, Victrix cavalry have got really big. Yeah, because really, I really stuck big. two of them on a sort of like cav side, and it's sort of like a square one, not a sort of like cav side base. And it's like all oh, phones, because they're supposed to be skirmishers. And I was thinking, yeah. if I tried to get a third one on there, oh, they no, would be right. sort of like very yeah. friendly figures. No, I, th- I think a lot of the 28 mil plastics, um, all my Arabs went on square bases. Um, 60 by yeah. 60 because it just wasn't possible to fit them on but, by oh no it's like all. the depth that had to be 60 by 60 but i'm talking about the width just to get the two oh. on there sort of like very yeah. close to, and if i tried to get a third one in the middle it's like oh that's well the that's um gonna... the the mongol cavalry that i mixed in some of my arabs next so i've got some um gripping beast arab cavalry and then some war um victrix mongol cavalry as well and the it's, mongol cavalry do you mean fireforge fireforge sorry fireforge fireforge was Fireforge ones have just got enormous, great fat asses, their horses, mm-hmm. in, yeah. in like a kind of comedic way. But I've actually, you're right, I've not painted up or made up any Victrix cavalry yet. But um, I've, I've got some sat in the cupboard for, for project number five on the list when I, whenever I get round to it. But Because um, I think those ones, because of particularly, because I've done um, Numidian, I think they were Victrix, and they looked like skirmishy. There was sort of like some room left on the base after I put two to a base. And the, yeah, the Romans are some of their earlier ones, yeah. Okay, and the Romans, um, they sort of like three to a base. They, f- I can't remember thinking, oh, that's a really tight squeeze. But yeah, them girls seem really, really, really big. So, but they're sort of like all prepped up and they're fine. Um, and I've just, um, I was just doing, uh, prepping up a, a the uh, wine cart that I was um, talking oh, about. Oh, it came. It arrived. Yeah, it's arrived. Um, that was um, the uh, the donkey type things are metal. The Cart itself is MDMF and the cargo Sorry, the, of the cart resin. The donkey type things, the donkeys. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, they donkeys. look. I mean, they were advertised as donkeys, but they look very, they look very big. They look very pony like, which is why I'm saying yeah, donkey mules type things. On donkeys. Yeah. Mule. I, I don't know. They're, it's just it's all it's all yeah, equine as far as I'm concerned. They will. Yeah, they look quite big. Um, and but the resin cargo, it's like because what I was while everyone else is talking. Um, mm. I do pay attention, honest. Um, once I sprayed it white, there's sort of like there was a gap all the way around between near enough all the way around between the cargo and the side of the thing, which is sort of like really obvious. So I've just been um just been sticking some milliput all around to sort of like make that solid. Although um it's something I heard once I heard you say, Tim, that I hope yeah. um your brother is trustworthy. So I remember you once saying when first doing ADLG and sticking bases mm. together with your mm. brother being carpenter. You my said brother-in-law, that he told you, my brother-in-law. Yeah, sorry, brother-in-law. Um, he said that PVA mm. is if you stick wood together with PVA, it's like a really, really solid yeah. thing. Mm. Wood glue. Fine. Wood glue. So because yeah. I didn't have a hundred and twenty mil base for my baggage camp, yeah. So um, I stuck two sixty mil squares together. So hopefully that they'll stay together. So that's done. And Honestly, the I've, other I've thing done that, that with a lot of my infantry, um, where I stuck two old, old star bases together. And, and it's still it's worked absolutely fine. So I think you've got no worries with that at all. Okay, good one. And the other thing that I ordered when I ordered that um, cart was I ordered some animals because mm-hmm. although I didn't think animals were good for baggage because it looks a bit like cluster for ambush markers. Quite often yeah. I see people with ambush markers and they just put down a wooden square or something, which is it's functional, but it sort of doesn't take very much effort to do an ambush marker that looks a little bit scenic. And what I've always done for 15 mil was I've got all my old DBM bases, which is mm. far too much spacage going on. And I've yeah. got a scene of a, like, a peasant hut or something that I've used. So I thought I'll just do some animals, animals sort of like on a base, a proper so made did up you do, base. Did you pick out, you know, because war bases do all sorts of animals. So did you pick out like their forest friends or something like that? What well, is, no, is I've done three. I've done yeah. three bases because Strat just needs three. So the first base is... No one here but us chickens. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> so yep. that's that's the first base. The second base is a badger looking suspicious. So you know where I've Badgers ambushed always look nights. suspicious though, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Exhibit A. Yeah. You know where I've ambushed me medium nights. Yeah. And um just sort of like because I sort of like looked on the internet um about um, what a badger actually looks like. Because if I'm going to paint it, I thought, oh, right, that's what it looks like. Um, Have you not been I, part of this podcast for the last 20 weeks? Well, I know. It's, and the it's, thing is, I, it's, I said that Peter's hair was starting to look badgerish, mm. but I knew it was sort of like, I knew badgers were sort of like black and white. Mm. And I knew sort of like they were sort of like they had that two tone look going on, but I didn't know whether they were wearing zoot suits or what the actual pattern was. So, yeah, um, key tie, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I had a look and one thing I came across because it's like Google set, um, throws up things is um, have you ever come across honey badges before? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they're hilarious, aren't they? It's well, not, not necessarily it's, nuts. All things are relative, but yeah, I suppose they have got their yeah, no, no, yeah. it's like there was one on YouTube. It's like because it's like because it said badges, different type of badges, colorations, and and honey badges are just mental or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. like, I had a look on the honey badges on YouTube, and there's things like a honey badger walking into the middle of a pride of lions. And, mm-hmm. and, and the, the pride of lions run off. Yeah, well, the voiceover was going. There are two mature adult females and four less mature lions, and the adult females want nothing to do with it because they've probably come across honey budgets before. Yeah. But the sort of like, younger ones, sort of like try and sort of like have a go at Fancy that. Sort of like yeah. honey bud and honey bud just like come just fab, yeah. and <laughs> it's just they're hilarious because they're only about that big and they look really cute, but they yeah. they are sort of like. Yeah, quite funny. So that was good. And uh, my other base is just sort of empty. So I'm just right. going to do sort of like scenic. Mm. And there's it's nothing there. Army. Or is there? Or Sorry? Is there? If it's a Roman army, you need geese. As in Horatio. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Nelson, right. isn't it? Um, that's, that's to do with ships. What about flaming pigs for the Romans? They use geese and the geese warn them that the... Uh, Whoever's Go- Gauls, I think, wasn't it? Or the Etruscans? Something. Then surely that would be a self-disclosing ambush, wouldn't it? That would sort of <laughs> defeat the object. That would be like, you might as well just put the troops straight on table. ADLG doesn't have room for the um, sort of like self-mobile bacon, does it? No, it does. It does. They're in, um, I think they're in one of the armies. Are they in a Spanish army or something? But I don't think it has that rule about they can't affect people across water, which was always the great bit of... Um, one of the many great obscure bits of the DBA. Yeah, the flaming pigs like. are there. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure they are because um, Bowie to make them as well in 15s. Um, so you can actually even even get them, which is it. Okay, so is that um, <laughs> well, you know, other other than researching honey badgers by accident, which I think is a great result for anybody's week, really, isn't it? Is it even okay. the name honey badger? I was thinking, oh, cute, sweet. Yeah, that name of Bond girl, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, possibly in in Peter's own version of um, James Bond, in which he plays the main character. So, Peter, um, <laughs> how's how's um, Miss Honey Badger, and um, and how's your painting been this week? When um, your your initial efforts at Winged Tazarisness last week were you were just flirting with Winged Tazars, weren't you, Mister um, Bond? I was flirting with them, and uh, basically started um, doing the horses because uh, I find it cathartic just um, painting away at the horses. Um, but then I've put that to the side just to finish off my Bavarians, which were looking very forlorn, which were nearly there, but not quite finished. And I just had a blast to finish them off. Um, but okay. um, yeah, the, the winged hazards seem to go together quite nicely. I was just uh, uh, looking at it and looking forward to it. So I've just been slowly sort of pottering through the horses and that, um, yeah. you know, painting them up. OK, so, so how many... Cause... Did you actually admit how many hussars you bought last week? Um, no. Can we, have, can we have another go at trying to get you to cough up how many horses? You, maybe just tell us how many horses you painted, and mm. then um, you won't have to tell us how many hussars you've got, but we will be able to work it out and, and sort of laugh quietly at you. Well, no, you won't laugh quietly. I'd laugh out quite loud. No, that's uh, possibly true, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, how many did I ta- He's having to take his socks off here, folks, if you're only yeah, listening it's to this in audio. It's not just the socks. It's just uh, no, no, a calculator yeah. out. I'll have yeah. to come back to you on that. You'll have to come back to us on that one. All right. So did you yeah. do some um, Bavarian flags then with the, the sort of BMW light blue checkerboard thing going on? Or... Um, well, I'm doing the Bavarian cavalry with the it's, uh, sort of like happily red and green. So it's quite enjoying that. All right. So yeah. that's that. Um, 
Is that the Bayern Munich colours? Is that their away strip or something like that? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's funny doing um, cavalry that's not all white. Yeah, I guess so. Well, are, they, are, they the, are they the light cavalry, Peter? I couldn't really see from the picture. No, they're not light. They're they're full on. They're proper full fat, aren't they? Uh, green good. and red with guns. Yeah, good. Yeah. So it is uh, going to be marvellous when we can actually get all this stuff on table and have a real good go at some of these rules, isn't it? It feels I like think, it's yeah creeping I think closer. We'll have an awful lot of Napoleonics. Yes, yeah, we're going to have some very big old goes at um at doing some Napoleonic stuff once once we yeah. start get back start getting back have into to have um like persuade them to do a Sunday there or something and uh, just have several large games in Napoleonics just to uh, give the rule set a proper go and have a couple of beers in the pub sort of thing um, no, I just think to make up for all lost time. I think that's definitely the answer, isn't it? And and with that look ahead to the future, I think that. Um, that wraps up the, the painting for the week. This means war. This means war. So look, the painting um, the painting is done. We've we've almost got a proper new sequence now after trialling it last week. And um, I think we'll stick with it, actually. But but last week, we delved into deep linguistics with Dave. And um, you were waving things at the screen. You were playing things off Google. You were you were telling us about your childhood. And, um, and I think our consensus was still that you're a bit of an arse. Uh, but in, in this week's episode, we've got Adam, who um, is, is boldly, um, well, strongly, putting himself forward here with um with i think your your issue this week is is that perennial war games classic of war games um war game scales so i think let's roll the theme music and um and we'll be into this week's episode of i'm sorry i think you're an ass coming up next on Madaxman radio it's i'm sorry i think you're an ass the antidote to inform discussion shows the piano this week is Scott Joplin, and your chairman is Sir Humphrey Humphreys. Hello and welcome everybody to this week's edition of I'm Sorry, I Think You're an Arse. You join us this week from the Emerald Assembly Hall in Mudford, Sock in Somerset, just to the west of Hummer. Located in the tranquil southwest of England, visitors to the town can climb to the top of the tower of the town's famous Norman Abbey, where they will be greeted with a view encompassing seven different counties. On a clear day, it's sometimes even possible to catch a glimpse of Plymouth off in the distance, despite the many prominent warning signs advising against this. When you say it's my issue of war game scales, it's not really my issue. It's everybody's issue of war game scale. And there's a good example is a conversation we just had about uh, the Victory Gallic Bastion Cavalry being somewhat large for 28 mil. Right. War game scales, firstly, are not war game scales. They are not scales. We've got 5 mil, 6 mil, 10 mil, 12 mil, 15 mil, 18 mil, 20 mil, 25 mil, 28 mil, and heroic 28 mil. These aren't scales. These are just like various numbers that people thought. I mean, what does 15 mil mean? Okay, 15 mil. Well, it's obviously not to the top of the figure because he might be wearing a hat we completely change it so quite often say oh it's from the foot from the toes to the eye well what if the bugger's crouching down or what if he's a horse or what if he's a tank right 15 mil is not a scale and it's not helpful because all that ha- all that happens is no two companies make figures the same size or to the same scale so quite often on facebook or chat groups you get things like oh the new Figure new 15 mil figures from or 25 mil figure from whatever company. How well does it go with other companies' 15 mil figures? And there's sort of a like whole debate about oh, can I buy these ones? Do they go with them ones? Do they go? And you even heard to hear terms like oh, Peter Pig, they're true 15 mil figures, which means all the other ones that you call them 15 mil ain't 15 mil figures, they're another bloody size, so you can't mix and match. What needs to happen is War gamers need to start talking about actual scales. So you need to start start talking about not 15 mil, but 1 one hundred, not 25 mil, but 156. Okay. Because then you can just sort of like be sure that when you're buying figures, 
they're the same size as the other figures you're buying. And when people are reviewing them, they can say, well, I don't bother with them. They're out, they're out of scale. They're not big enough. Or usually, these usually it's always, they're too big. Because you had 25 mil, which turned into 28 mil for some reason that I'm not sure. Where. And then that turned into heroic 28 mil, which is actually 30, 32 mil which is what War Games figures were in the 1960s, and people in the 1960s thought that was too big, so they invented 25 mil. I had to go, well, I didn't have to, but because I got 10 mil American Civil War, or is it 12 mil, I'm not quite sure, American Civil War armies and World War II armies, I bought some Engage Railway track because it's the right size, and for sort of American Civil War and World War II, it's, it's good for scenery, it's good for scenics. Um, and most of my American Civil War and World War II battles now happen quite close to a railway line because I don't know if you know, know this, but Engage Railway isn't very big, but it's bastard expensive. But it looks cool. It is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and so it gets used at every given opportunity. But the thing is, I got that from Model Zone in Holborn, which isn't there anymore. It's sort of like it's now a hotel, I think. But I went in and sort of like bought some Engage um, tracks. And I could go to any other model railway shop and I could buy an engaged train and pull it on the track and it would fit because it's the same scale. And if it didn't fit, I could go back to the shop and say to the bloke behind the counter, who's a bit of a railway nerd, because they always are in these sort of shops. And I would say, doesn't fit on the tracks, mate. And he would he would just he would say, no, it's got to. And he would get out of his own track and we'd pull it on. And if it didn't fit, he would be outraged and he would be ringing up the company saying, this doesn't fit, it's out of order. And as war gamers, for some reason, we accept that, oh, this 10 mil tank or this 12 mil tank, another company, exactly the same tank, completely different bloody size. And why do we accept this? So whenever you are buying new figures, email the manufacturer sir, and say, I just want to first and say, I just want to check. You see, you say that they, these figures are 15 mil, but that's just an arbitrary number. Can you tell me what scale they're made to, please? Can you tell me what scale they're cast in? And get the manufacturers to say what scale they're doing, because then you'll know exactly how big they are and whether they match up. And then maybe more game manufacturers will start being honest about the size of the figures. There you go. That's 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 me for today. Thanks. You're talking about when you when uh, have having conversations online. I. I do these 15 millimeter figures fit with the with this manufacturer's 15 millimeter. Someone someone will always interject. Well, I you can get these ones. I for I from Esky, which are 20 mil. <laughs> or these ones yeah. in 28 mil from Warlord are better. Yeah, but you just proved my point. That's a good reason not to have those conversations. No, no, I, I, no, I think Tamsin, you've got a very, very good point there, because what that allows you to do is it's kind of like a filter mechanism so you know there is a lot of people online in the world of wargaming internet who talk absolute tosh but because they hide behind anonymous names sometimes or they might live abroad or stuff it's very hard sometimes to work out who the complete toxic idiots you want to avoid like the plague are who are just actually there to push their own opinion but are going to try and sort of sneak it in later on and and you don't really need to but because different manufacturers have different scales, you always know you can ask that question. And as Tamsin says, within three posts, when you're saying, how big are these two 15 mil figures? Somebody will go, the 28s from these ones are much better. And then you can go block, 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 delete. You're an idiot. I'm never going to talk to you. you so you're saying it's a feature, not a bug. I'm saying it's a feature which has a knock-on benefit in the internet world because it allows you to identify plonkers that you don't want to listen to so much, when much you're more easily so would you say that in 2003 when office word for some reason kept we sight we doing all my typing on on word to sort of like 9.5 comic sans that was that was that was a feature not a but it's not because no, what Adam, you can Adam, do 9.5 no, comic no, sans is, is a font not a scale that's the issue you'd still have those conversations because instead of talking about is it the size that it claims to be Right. I mean, I remember David not being out, Dave, not never being able to find a janissary to service his needs because he thought they were all rubbish. Right. If a new oh, company. Yeah, that, was, that was that was that was a fabulous six month period of our lives, wasn't it? Every week <laughs> there was another failed janissary experiment that would. But if a new company bought out 
the perfect 15th century January, January, that would be brilliant, apart from the fact it might be sort of like 20% too big. But you can still have those conversations because instead of saying, have they made it the right size, you can talk about style. And I don't mind companies making figures in different styles because then that's sort of like custom choice. I mean, I think we said, I said yesterday about 15 mil figures. I really like both Corvus Belli and Merlison. Very different styles. Would never use them together, like them both. There's a conversation there about which to use, which to prefer, that's fine. So you can still have those conversations to isolate the nutters, although in this hobby, the nuts is quite hard to isolate because there's yeah. herds of them roaming across the plains. But you can still have conversations about best war games figures without having to sort of like pretend that they're all the right size when they're bloody not. Can you can you not have those conversations about style with an extra layer of geeky complexity that involves numbers and maths and and because one of the great things about um you know style is a subjective discussion and then it sort of peters out but the great thing about wargaming scales is surely that that scale is a subjective discussion because you can go these are 15 mil and then other people go no but these are 15 mil and no that's not and then you're right it is a subjective different. discussion but that's not a great thing that's a bad thing okay a sherman tank from two different companies should be the same size in the same scale. And saying, mm. oh, this one's bigger than that. Well, but does it matter? Wrong. Yeah, because if you've got a Sherman, Sherman tank that's 25% bigger than that one, it's just like, oh, that looks a bit shit, doesn't it? And the whole reason why we do this hobby is because it's supposed to look good. That's the reason why we do toy soldiers rather than cardboard counters even though you can get nice looking cardboard counters, but that's the reason why we do it, because it looks good. So if you've got a giant next to a pygmy having a fight and they're supposed to be the same size, it, it you're, looks... You're playing that game that Andy, Andy plays. One of them is going to be a skeleton, isn't it? That could be it. You know, so one could be a dwarf, one could be a skeleton. I, I've just made the point that human beings aren't made in the same scale, so why should we expect miniature figures to all to be exactly the same height? Yeah, no, they are made in the same scale. They're all one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Right, they're not the, the same is, height, though, are they? Yeah. And even if they're not the same height, the Bren gun that they carry is all the same size. Isn't it? It's the equipment's all the same size. Well, I might so, be a yeah. sort of, like, six-foot handsome geezer, and you might be a sort of, like, four-foot eleven dwarf. But if we're both carrying the same rifle, the rifle's the same size. So it should be I the think same if you both had the same zoom filter, you'd both be a four-foot eleven dwarf as well. But um, that's, <laughs> oh, that's probably being unfair to Andy. That that, that might not be a filter. Um, but uh, but I think... But it's, doesn't it just, though, that it's part of the massive flavour of different manufacturers having their own ranges with their own characters? Because if they're all a totally different style, they might as well be slightly different heights. And then can't you just stick a bit of cardboard underneath them to, to kind of even them out if you're that, that obsessed about it? No, you can't because it's like equipment still not the same size. It's like one's got a gun that's 50 percent bigger than the others and it, sh and it should, be, should be the same size. And no, it's, I mean, imagine any other... So I gave an example of railways. It's like, imagine any other hobby where it's like, oh, well, it's like they might be a different size, but it's good. No, it's like, I don't know, if you play golf and you go and buy a set of adult golf clubs and they're 30% shorter than the other adult golf clubs, you wouldn't go, oh, that's an interesting feature. I'll talk to my friends on the internet about different sizes of golf clubs. It should all be the same bloody size. No, you would take it back to the shop and say, I want a proper size set of golf clubs. Thank you very much. I don't know. You, you might be assuming too much about other hobbies. Da Dave, You do, can we like tempt you back to remember your cycling days of um, Shimano gears and, and all sorts of technical things about... It, was that all completely compatible or was it always like actually this one does fit a bit better with this one even though they're um, supposed to be shimano and campagnolo did not mix i mean you could try it but you need to stick uh, a bit of cardboard underneath wouldn't well, you saying, yeah. that, saying that if you've got a 52 52 tooth ring on your front of your bike then it's always the same number i mean that's always the same number of rings it's the same diameter and things like that yeah so Dave, if you bought a 30 inch wheel wheel from one company and a 30 inch wheel from another com company would they both be 30 inches uh no not necessarily 
Well, you, I would bloody complain. I'll take it back and complain. I'll say this wheel's the wrong bloody size. And the, and the bloke in that model railway shop would say, "Sir, please go away. I only deal with trains. Actually, You've no, got to stop coming back here." No, O was a scale. Yes. Yeah. But fifteen millimeter is not a scale, is it? It's just uh, fifteen. Millimeter. That's what I'm saying. It's just yeah. a random number that manufacturers sort of like say, even though it's relevant to nothing it's like and again at the point of sort of saying oh this is a real 15 mil figure which means all the others aren't real 15 mil figures they're just sort of like some other random nonsense wouldn't wouldn't that take like a lot of the art out of the hobby and the the creativity of it with these people had to do some sort of scientific you know scale foot to eye thing it's it's you know it's a sculptor expressing themselves and if their little bloke is is a smidge shorter than the next little bloke but they're all kind of consistent and look cute you know, what you're talking about is is outlawing Mike's models figures, really, um, casting them out into the wilderness. Well, funnily enough, I'm not, because they're probably bang on 15 mil, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but they're a bit chubby, though, aren't they, really? You know, they're very well, well like, it's like, But it's like a Tamiya 1350 model of the Turpits. That's a sculptor expressing his Turpitsness. And it's like, it's... The, like the size is correct because they've got a sort of like but I mean, the problem I just, is uh, Adam is that at certain scales if you just did it exactly to scale the figures would look out of um, out of size because the smaller the scale it just you know some work better than others as to how it's actually set up so if you actually did it to scale you wouldn't have say the detail in some of the aspects also, also things, like what you mean. things like weapons and equipment would end up too thin to be able to, to be able to cast. That's yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, weapons and equipment are almost always I mean, bigger than blades, they should be. Sword blades would be microns. Okay, for the uh, yeah, and for the casting process, you might have to thicken them up. But a six foot spear on one figure should be the same length as a six foot spear on another's figure because they're both the size of a tree trunk and um then it's just but it just looks fatter you're being fattest you're rather than lengthy models you're talking about mike's models again yeah true you? actually yeah you could be right yeah yeah and the back of those horses from um fire forge as well um but, well but, I, I, the fire forge horses but, but a mongol horse is so they were technical ponies so they would be quite broad yeah but there's broad yeah. and there's but they're too big yeah they are they're, ponies they should be like ragged little ponies whereas yeah. they look like fat ass could be as big as most European horses. Okay. Okay. But with, with big butts. Okay. Yeah. It's just, um, it's, I mean, the definition is more, more about sort of the coat, yeah. the broadness, yeah. and, and hardiness and what yeah. they can withstand. So, yeah. but, it, but it just isn't it though, just more about choice though, letting. People have different choices, different manufacturers. Some people yeah. want a slightly bigger figure and all the rest of it. Absolutely. And if you want a slightly bigger figure, you can buy a 172nd inst instead of a 176. That's absolutely fine. Or if you want slightly smaller, you can get a 1 100th. But at least you'll know if you buy a 1 100th, it will be compatible with the other 1 100th figures, as opposed to, oh, this 15 mil, actually they're 18 mil. Well, they're not 15 mil then, are they? You're lying to me. Or well, thirteen point five, the new um, heroic scale American Civil War. Yes, and it's, it's, yeah. no, that's just them going. Oh, I don't want you. I don't want you to buy other manufacturers because once you've bought these, you can't buy anyone else's. Which might work as a business model. It means I don't care how good they are. I'm not going to buy them because they don't go mm. with what I've already got. But I mean, and that is that's just at least that's honest. That's a company saying, yeah, we're trying to sort of like capture this market, so we're deliberately doing a different size as opposed to doing a 13 and a half millimeter and claiming it's a 10 mil figure which is what a lot of companies do quite possibly okay um anybody else chipping in to um the uh, adam's um relentless rant there of um <laughs> of beat it or have we all been beaten into submission i'm utterly confused by this scale oh, what what confuses you dave well, or... i thought airfix was um 172 isn't that a scale? Uh, yeah. Ethics, well, the models were mostly 172nd, but the figures were 
described as HO slash OO. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. they were somewhere which they were somewhere in between the two gauges, railway gauges. I think they were about 178th scale. <laughs> so he's always been there. So Did you say yeah. HO slash OO? I always thought it was ooh, ooh scale. Oh, I think that's the South Coast thing, Adam. That's um, that's yeah, you're mixing with too many pensioners. That could be it. Yeah, or maybe it's a Sutton thing. So is yeah. what, what is it? One seventy second of what? Eight? Well, that means one seventy second is so was chosen because that means one inch equals six foot. Yeah, one seventy second is one inch equals six foot. It means that the figure is seventy two times smaller than reality. But why seventy two? Well, they chose 172 because it makes six foot one inch, which is sort of like height of a man one inch. That's why 172nd was chosen as a scale. How does 172nd relate to 15 millimetre or 18 millimetre? It's bigger than 15 millimetre. So Isn't it more of the maturity of the, um, the model railway stuff, though? Or something? Um, what so you're saying that if I just wait around another 15 years, I'll start doing proper scales? Yeah, because model railways, I mean, the, the first ones were set up, um, in, what 18 late 19th century, and it took about what 50 years for them to start getting standard scales. But the scales Peter, have about you been were using Google the next again 40 years? So There's give me another five or ten, and it might start standardizing a bit. Peter, have you been more... using Google again, or do you know a surprising amount about model railways? Um, uh, my dad used to love model railways and explain some of this, and I just had to check the details. Well, I <laughs> he explained it all to me at one point, and I totally lost me. I think with the increase in three D sculpting and sort of sort of re either res resin and plastic cut casting of figures. We are going. I you will see a more standardisation on scales rather than sizes. I think a plastic soldier company, their fi their fifteen millimeter figures are one to one hundred scale. Yeah. And in that case, that if that is if that is the case, is anyone going to say that's a bad thing? Is that HLO? No, that's one to one hundredth. Ah. No, isn't HOO one to 100? No. No. HOO, there's, no, there's no such really? railway gauge no. as HOO. -O. Oh, right. There's an HO, there's an HO, there's an OO. <laughs> and there's an gauge, -O which is not smaller, but surprisingly more expensive. HO, I think, is 187, and OO is, is I think, 172nd. That could well be it. But I, I think the 3D printing thing is is a good point. So I think within our lifetimes, potentially, there will come a scenario in which everybody can just print their own figures and you'll be able to make them however damn big you want. Um, you know, you'll just be able to scale up or scale down the file and, and print it to whatever scale you want. And that's that's kind of coming. You'll just turn a dial on the side of the machine and you'll be away. Um, and then it will be a question of whether the when that happens whether the artistry of the individual manufacturers and the sculptors who've done things who who just because they're artists and not scientists make their figures about 16 mil or 16 and a half mil or or 15.5 or, or or 15 and chubby or, or something like that and it's down to the difference between these things being handmade from masters by little sculptors by shoving little bits of milliput onto a wireframe and it just kind of wobbles around a bit but i think that era is going and and something beautiful could be lost with that no what i suspect with that though is what's happened with figure scales is they always get bigger five mil when i was a lad you had five mil heroics and ross big one page advert in military modeling that I used to talk oh, about yeah, one month it would be the World War II stuff and next month it would be all the other other stuff five mil and then you had sort of like GHQ and the regular all doing, doing six mil and again 10s turned in 12 mil 15s turned into 18 25 turned in 28 and what I suspect is to make a better figure 
definition, better figure, a more detailed figure. If you make it a bit bigger, it's a bit easier to work with. You can get a bit more detail on. So look, we made it bigger and it's a better figure. Well, no, it's not because it's not the right scale. So isn't isn't big, that our fault as consumers for wanting nicer figures than can be produced in 15 mil or 25? Yeah, quite quite possibly. But I'm not saying that I've got any respect for most war gamers either. But that's not a get out, is it? <laughs> True. Yeah, I suppose you may be right there. But um, so this is, but this is this is true. People wanting to make bit better figures. Oh, can I just can I just say, um, all the war gamers that listen to this podcast have proved that they've got style and culture, and therefore of course. I have yes, a huge amount of respect for them. Absolutely. Yeah. There's there's respect all that's round. Seven to all, of us, all... so that's yeah. seven of us plus Martin Bexilia and a couple of others listening to it. Yeah. It's all Tasman, good. scarily enough, that probably sums it up quite well. Yeah, that could be the one. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, look, so we've we've gone around the houses on scale. Anybody else to, to chip in or are we at the um the, the point of decision? Um is Adam's position that all war games figures should be the same damn size. Um no, 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 no. Different no? sizes, fine. One one hundredth, one fifty-sixth, engage fine lots of choice fine and but it's, it's that's a limited that's limiting it, isn't it? not 148 or 150th well yeah just so i just it's not for me to say but just bloody sort it out yeah don't tell me it's 25 or 28 or heroic 28 tell me it's 150 second i don't care just yeah. tell me what it is so you don't care about the different sizing you just care about them actually saying what actual scale it is i care about getting what i'm being told of I've, what i bought so actually go back so you want all of the in inverted commas 15 mil people to in the ideal world to actually be making figures that are the same size rather yeah, than one 100 15 mil is let's face it everyone pretends it's one 100 and i think peter i think it's peter pig figures that are more or less bang on and all the others sort of like bigger but yeah 15 mil figures let them do one 100 because then they can be compatible then they can so and then i can make a choice on style and artistic merit rather than oh this one's too big it doesn't go with that one even though it should do because apparently they're the same scale which they're not okay all right well look um anybody else with a, another comment on um on different scales or but the, the oh the, i in. think the thing is it's more on the the gaming system though because it's what most games we play is more about the the base size as opposed to the you know you can go up and down with the figures I mean, we were talking earlier about, you know, your 28 mil army and Simon was saying about his 15 mil and how many he can get on a base, but you're still looking more about the base size and how it looks. So you've still got your individual interpretation on that. Now, now see, I'm with Adam. It does bug, it does bug me that when you go and buy two miniature ranges, so you buy vendor one and vendor two, both say they're 15 mil miniatures. And one of them is the size of Dave. One of them is the size of Graham Briggs. You know, both are nominally 15 mil, but one's, you know, five foot eight, one six foot three. And yes, I know in humanity there is variance, but when it does become really exaggerated on the miniature base when someone says these are both 15 mils and you've got a very slender 15 mil versus a rather hefty one or... I call it 15, but it's more 18 going on 20. If they could standardise like they've done the train ranges where HO scale is HO scale. So all the manufacturers can make whatever they want, design how they want, but HO scale is HO scale. So you get the right size bogies, put on the train tracks, right couplings, it all works, ta-da. But everyone can have their own designs. Because the amount of miniature ranges like I've got, you know, where you can't have some ranges with some other ones. Well, we've all been there, where you buy some pikemen from one range and then you buy some footnotes for the next one, and the pike, you know, standing over them or whatever. And you sort of look at it and go, it just looks a bit naff. And I know they're just toy soldiers and, you know, we play a pub, the lights are the best. But sometimes you just look at it and go, really? <laughs> I mean, well, Tim, you're, you're, theoretically, you're Swiss. Yeah. Yeah, you're theoretically, Swiss. you could actually have a claim against the manufacturers under the trading standards act if they say these are 15 mil figures and it turns out that they're a lot bigger or a lot smaller whether it's worth doing anything about it is a different matter but in theory you could complain to trading standards 
I think that's Andy, what's your job in the real world? <laughs> Yeah. I think that's the point at which we do need to go around the screen and say, yeah, Adam, your your call for a consolidation of scales around true fifteen, true twenty five, true the other one, and and true ten mil. Um, is that you know, is that a clarion call we can all support, or are you just being an ass? So let's start going around. We'll start with them, um, Peter. Do you, do you back it, or or what do you think? Um, I understand where he's going, but I can't quite back it until someone actually sorts out the scales that we should be going for. Because there's too many different compositions that have too many different scales. So that, that way you just can't have a consistency. So what do you think? Yeah, at the moment, I'll ask. No. Tamsin? Adam, you're right, but you're being an ass. <laughs> Andy, from a legal perspective. I agree with Tamsin. Right. Okay. Simon, what about you? I'm with Adam. I can. It'd be nice to get to the point of we have a consistent range of scales, whatever they are. So then you've got consistency. And therefore you can go and buy from vendor one, vendor two, you can buy whatever miniatures and they all fit neatly or roughly within a millimeter of that scale rather than my 15 bigger than your 15 and it just looks naff. So I'm firm with Adam on this one. Dave, you know, other than other than your, you know, puzzlement with what the concept of scale actually means, where where are you on this one? Uh, Adam lost me with model zone being turned into the Hoxton Hotel. So what do you think? Uh, I prefer the Hoxton Hotel. But that's not one of the options here. No, do you support uh, his contention, or you think he's big enough? Uh, right. I, okay. I, I tend to agree with Adam. I think it would be better if Zeiston figures were the same size as Essex figures. Okay, so no ask there. And so, properly. So, all right. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see why you have to lose the uh, quality of the sculpt just by being three millimeters different. So okay. I, I agree with you. Right. So we're we're three and two. So with me, I think it's a tough old call, and you know, even though I I think it's impossible to achieve in the real world. Sadly, Adam, I think I do agree with you. It would be lovely if figures were actually more bloody similar. It, because if only for the fact it would reduce by about 50% the amount of pointless traffic on um, on most internet forums and discussion boards. Um, it may well undermine the traffic to, um, to various parts of my website with photos of figures next to each other dramatically as well. But, but I only make pennies in Google advertising now and the eBay money's just nonsense as well so so it's not economically important to me so so i think we've got a 50 50 split on 50 percent. i'm sorry i think you're an ass 50 percent. you may actually have a point well as the barkery sentence construction of time hits the english language of destiny i see that that's all we've got time for on this week's episode so we'll see you next week on i'm sorry i think you're an ass yeah, I think that's the first time that there's not been an arse right. Yeah, <laughs> the first time there's no been Are you feeling left out, Adam? No one's yeah. actually said scale creep either. Nobody said the word scale creep. This means war. We didn't actually have the, um, the discussion about painting eyes on war games figures either, um, which I think I forgot to bring up. Cause I, I sent that thing around on the um, yeah, yeah, WhatsApp yeah. group earlier. Yeah. Is this something anybody does? Um, I have done for character figures. So even I've done you, a couple Tamsi, of times on character, only do it for character mil. figures. Yeah, I but, even then I've, I, I did it on a few, and essentially I've most mostly I've stop doing it unless there's unless there's a I I think with painting eyes it's doing it. Putting a shade in so it they look darker, I think yeah. that looks exactly what you need. I mean, because look at a normal person. Walk away from someone and see how far away you, how big they still are that you can't actually see the whites of their eyes, literally, before it, and it's like not very well, far. Don't attention. don't don't put down Zulu. No, definitely not put down Zulu. No, because there was there was some. Um, I saw oh, something. Right. On... Don't shoot until you can see the whites of their eyes. What? Uh, yeah. Uh...
about two yards away. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. oh, there you oh. go. Yes. Yeah. No, because I, I saw, um, I read about somebody's technique on um, uh, Led Adventure this week, and they were saying they do a, a, like a black stripe and then get like a pin and do the white either side of it. Um, so they don't put the, they don't do white and then put a dot in it. They they do a black thing and, and, and do that. And it sounded almost easier, but it's so difficult. Even looking at these normally Victrix 28 mil figures, it would be very, very difficult to to paint eyes into them. And you just don't see them unless that's maybe yeah, our The other age. bit when painting eyes, don't use pure white. Okay, because we're all slightly um, red-eyed about it all. Uh, use, use an yeah. off-white. The best colour I found is actually my Vallejo deck tan. Fake tan? Deck tan. Vic. Sort of greyish, slightly grey, uh, slightly greyish white. Slightly greyish. I, I used to do eyes when I was painting up the Pathfinder stuff, like the Suns, on uh, Reaper miniatures. Yeah. And um, it was it was basically doing the um, the white and then trying to put a line in um, mm. for the yeah. eyes. It was hard, so you could they don't end up like that. that yeah, that was yeah the they end up trying to get it whiff, so they're not sort of boz eye. No, yeah. One side or the other. No, I, I, I had a horrendous eye experience when um, I think I must have been in my early twenties or something, and I had an in a twenty eight mil, probably twenty five mil at a time, properly Indian army, and and all the figures were lambing, um, who who I think somebody has just kind of recreated them, um, or, or bought the range. It might even be Dave Hutchby actually, but there was a hundred of these longbowmen based for sixth so they're in really close formation in two ranks and in 25 mil they covered basically about four foot of the table in just a solid line of identical um you know tan skinned figures all looking very very similar and and they had quite well sculpted you know faces they were kind of a bit like big peter pig figures really really well kind of cut and one time i've been looking at them i thought i've i got to be able to do eyes on this i've got to become a better painter and so i went across all 100 of them and painted eyes on them and then it basically looked like somebody had been you know a massed battery of fried eggs had been fired at this these people and kind of caught them all in the face and they were all just like staring, like absolute lunatics um across the table and and i think i played like one game with it and just looked at it and went and I just went and painted them all out again. Um, you know, uh, 200 eyes. I just painted the whole lot back out again. And it was must have been maybe a decade later, looking at something online, and I realised the big secret with painting eyes is to paint eyebrows as well. Because if you just paint white and put a dot in the middle, it just doesn't have any definition. It literally looks like they've been hit by a, a volley of fried eggs. So I've always had the heebie-jeebies about painting eyes after that. I just very, very rarely do it. Very rarely do it indeed. But well, um, say the, the eyes but look, were following you around the table. Oh, these, these would have followed you around dark alleys. They were really kind of um, quite disturbing. But, but in terms of things that are, are quite disturbing, um, I think, Who's um who's been playing some games this week, Andy? Uh, has there been a disturbance in the force in your ongoing sequence of events with um with Dave Ray over in the states? Uh, yes, I, I won the Battle of Manticode as the uh, Nicophorian Byzantines. Get in! Oh, well done. History. Yeah, my, my 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 center cons consisted of uh, four units of Scutat or with a unit of medium spears. He'd lined up all his uh, shooting cavalry in the middle. I just marched towards them, and they thought, "Don't fancy that." And they scattered like a curtain parting. And um, then, you know, he's then fighting me from two different wings. And I managed to chase one wing more, off the, more or less off the battlefield. So that went well. Excellent. I didn't uh, like it up in Mr. Mannering. Yeah. Medium cavalry. Or the medium arrow cavalry you chased away with the, with the shooters. Yeah, they, they just took the view that, well, you know, we don't want to charge these guys because they've got spears. Um, mm. And we don't want to stand around and shoot at them because they're plus one shooting at us. Ah, excellent. All right. And any other games? Um, Simon, did you did you get on an online game of um, something this week? Yeah, so um, Dave and I last week had a game of Renaissance. We gave one of the later period armies a good game. So we had Louis XIV versus Restoration British. So 
French on British, never happened before. So um, it's a good fashion squabble. We, we tried one of the uh, slight tweak to one of the rules just to make impact foot, uh, which the French have, a little bit more effective in my first major draft, which I made a little bit too weak and they were quite ineffective. This one here it had a better feel. So there was um, the British outnumbered the, the, the French because you know, they're more just a shooting army. The French had the better quality mounted and these impact foot, so it all came for a good scrap. And they um, walked up, you know, slowly pushed through the center of the table. We um, had quite a few uh, mounted melees running on and the French finally um, charged in and there was some rather horrible pike, um, pike battles. And then all of a sudden the center and one flank of Dave's uh, British started to collapse rather heavily. So, um, it, it gave a far better feel of, uh, of the impact foot we tried in Fongal, where it never really had that right feel. Like, you know, yeah, it was, it was just it was just never quite as good as um, salvo foot, was it? It was just sort of a subpar salvo foot, but it wasn't quite as good as just normal pike and shock because it didn't put out enough shooting. Yeah, so um, so what we've done is that they now shoot effectively it's the same as other infantry. Because from a simplicity of ADLG, it just makes life easier. You just pay more for the impact. So you, then you get that slight difference in army sizes of, you know, and a more vanilla army of just shooting will be slightly bigger. But if the infantry can get in reasonably unmoored, life gets interesting. So there were some um, good punch ups. We had um, some shock mounted running around causing carnage and people going in flanks and dragoon fights and all that. So it felt like a good proper renaissance battle. You know, things happened, dragoons were hiding in fields, it's all good. Yeah, that's good because I've, I've been, you know, thinking about I've got so, far too many units even to play Fogar <laughs> of those Louis XIV French, and I've been thinking about rebasing some of them. So, so if it's kind of working out all right, that will um, that would be quite handy. Yeah, we've I've had a couple of games. That, we've had a few games now of uh, Louis XIV, um, later Austrians, so the um, later Austrians versus Poles, those type of armies, or you know, the very late armies, League of Augsburg, and we get some interesting feelings because. One of the things that always bugged us in Fogar was, especially the later period, it basically became of who can get as many infantry down with regimental guns and an inspired commander and you basically can't break the army. Yep. Boring. Here, it's very difficult, as we all know, to really span the entire table um, and you can chip away at an army a little bit more effectively. So you've got the and by having a bit more mountain and all that, and the mountains are some are good, some are bad, and all that, you get a slight bit different feeling here and there. So um, violence does happen. You seem to get uh, quite a good result so far. You, and some of the historical map chops actually work your play reasonably historic. Like, you know, when Hazars chase in Turks, if the Turks stand, the wing Hazars will cause them some carnage. But if they get in the flanks and have good terrain and all that, they're in a bit of trouble. So it you know, feels quite good. It well, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, should I do that? And then I suddenly thought, oh my god, that'd be even more rebasing. That might have to wait for a bit. I need to actually paint some damn stuff, really get get something kind of properly done. Okay, all right. Well, look, that's um, that's this week's um, battles played. This means war. So with, um, with the sounds of battle receding into the, the distance now, we, we move on to another one of our regular features, the one that everybody looks forward to, the world of, I think last week, Andy, you actually had an answer that had a French general called Le Disco, didn't you? So um, yeah. the, the music is getting getting much more um, more prominent. So let's sit back and, and enjoy the music and return with your quiz. So, Mr. Finkel, hit us with last week's music. No, not musical. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the um, the theme last week. But last week's cross channel, last week's cross channel thematic questions and answers. Right. The first question was: Who, commanding an army for the first time at the age of seventy, beat the invading French army in a battle at Lincoln? I suspect uh, Tamsin knows the answer, but does anybody else? 
Lincoln fascinates me. That's um, I, didn't, I didn't even know there were battles up there, but who, who would it be? The Earl of Pembroke. William Marshall. Correct. What? So what, what war? When? What? How did that all happen? Uh, how did this uh, battle fight? Second Baron's War? It, no, it was 1217. Well, they, 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 basically, the barons had got... Uh, King John had done um, Magna Carta and gone back in his world, and they got... Some of the barons got fed up of him, and I think they invited the French in to invade. And at one stage, a French army turned up at Lincoln, and hmm. Sir William Marshall fought and beat them, and that helped to uh, restore King John to his throne. At that point... Lincoln's not wildly close to the coast, is it? Um He's an amazing character, William Marshall. He was uh, he was the he was the main knight of England for a long time. He he's, he's almost got to the crown, I think, at one point. Yeah, he, he developed Chepstow Castle um, into what it is to what it was before it got ruined, basically. But he, he built a lot onto it. And right. um, today, well, it wasn't twelve eighteen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A national trust site that uh, um, was, um, yeah. you know, he was, he was the yeah. knight who won all the tournaments. That was his claim to fame as a kid and when he was young. So, how big was this battle at Lincoln then, though? Is it, um, you know, because I've it's my home county, but um, I'm just fascinated that there was a battle Probably about at what, 5,000 to side type of numbers. Yeah, okay. I think so it's actually, it actually the second battle of Lincoln. That's was was it, one. my lord. Okay. And um, I will have to dig out and see which ADLG list would work for that. Then maybe that's um, maybe that's a future podcast or something like that. Twelve fifty in the French. All right, okay. So that's um, that's the first one. Sorry, let's let's get back to the answers. What hit us with the next question, Andy? Right. The question was: What unique honour was conferred on British double agent Eddie Chapman after he returned to his German spy master in France after a mission in England? Iron Cross. That's right. Wow. He was the only <laughs> British citizen ever to be awarded the Iron Cross. Did, um, and when he was a double agent, which one did he like the most? Was he actually one of ours, really, or one of theirs? It's very the he was one of ours. He was, yeah. The oh, right, he was a double agent that way. Okay. No, yeah. Been a Both. Agent. Yeah. Okay. All right, then. Um, and, and the final cross-channel, um, you know, right. underlaid well, by was... customs question and answer. We shall fight them on the beaches, said Winston Churchill in 1940. England has been invaded by armies on several occasions. How many times did the invaders have to fight their way ashore? One, two or three? I think it's one. I can only think of one. And which um, one's that? Julius yeah. Caesar. That's right. That's the one. OK. All right. All the others have been um, unopposed landings. Yeah. Couldn't be a bother to fight. Yeah. No. Right, so this week's quiz is called... Uh, was the... Um, what about the French one? Which French one? They landed one? in Wales. This and they got beat up by the locals. Fishguard, they didn't have to fight their way off the beaches. They got in and then the women in Fishguard sent them well, back. They got beaten up by the yeah. women. Yeah, yeah no, they, they came ashore, got, went to a pub, got a bit pissed, and then, and then some of the local ladies turfed them out and captured them. That's <laughs> not an invasion, that's a stag <laughs> Yeah, imagine nowadays stag-nine, they would have invaded Latvia, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah, the well yeah. bag night. That's what it is. oh god, yeah, gagging in the dripping, dripping, yeah. Oh, that woman that run that B and B, she was just crazy, wasn't she? Was that the B and B? Are we talking about the B and B in Cardiff, where we um yeah. we kind of, I think I had to inch the car down this um really narrow you know place and and reverse it into their car park and we got there sort of six in the evening and um we were all getting the stuff out of the car and um, the woman said is that everything out of your car and i said oh no i'm going to pop back and get my bag and she said you better get in now because i'm going to let the dogs out in the yard <laughs> <laughs> and then when we went for breakfast the next day she was deeply unpleasant to us or, or very um efficient and then um to other people she was chatting away to them happily in welsh it was um it was charming. It was a charming, charming bit. No, 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 I think it was in Carnethley that um, it was. It was her view on um, the uh, the flower of French uh, Welsh maidenhood coming down from the valleys into Newport. Oh yes, so, no, that, that was that was the one that we stayed in the, the countryside, wasn't it? No. That yeah. was, um, it was in us. In, it was when we played in us, but we stayed in 
in wherever's the foodie place that's um, sort of up the up the river from it. Yeah, a gagging and a dripping. But um, you know, in terms of a gagging and a dripping, I think that probably means it's time for the music, and then Andy will come back with his next week's questions. <laughs> Okay then, Andy. Hit us with um, whatever the theme is this week. After well, the theme this week is just words. So, question one: What does the term "hoist on his own petard" literally mean? Okay. Question two: In World War Two, what was a tommy cooker? The answers to these. Yeah. And question three. What is the literal original meaning of the term deploy? Wow. Okay, well, that's, that's a question for even... And it's not, theater, it's not a theatre production in the West Midlands. But, right. but as, as the tumbleweed fades into the distance, I think we will, um, we will call on Andy's quiz music to end the quiz. <laughs> All right, well, look, with them, with the quiz fading into the French Gallic background, um, we're just really into that roundup of, of what's coming up. And I think this week, there's it's been a week of actually starting to think about competitions in future hasn't it and, and think about games in future which has kind of been a little bit weird so um who's been who's been doing any forward planning this week who wants to start us off maybe adam what about you down the uh, bottom there well it's a few things firstly it's um i've actually booked to go to reading for the first time in over a decade i think um which wow. will be um, a thing um i wouldn't recommend it because the competition's in ascot all right reading war games competition in ascot and um uh, just and I'm um, probably going along to the London Grand Tournament, which yeah. um, will be an um, interesting thing. Um, mm-hmm. If Tim can, no, that's sorted. I've 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 arranged to fix that. We have a um, a a Spanish ringer in our three person team. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> indeed, yeah. Um, and the other thing I was thinking of doing, and it might be worth getting some um, feedback, is come July or maybe August time, I was thinking of getting hold of Pete, who runs a toyman, and seeing if he's up for doing sort of like an ad hoc quick um, ADLG. Yeah. If we can get sort of like 12 people down, would people be up for that? Yeah. I think I think you'd be beating them off with a shitty stick, to be honest. there's Everybody's going to be so <laughs> desperate to do um, competition. Yeah, so I, I might see if every I week. Can, I might see if I can get um, something together at Entoyment. Um And if if it's at least 12 people, I might do sort of like, because people just want to play with a toy, so I might try and do a 15 and a 25. As long as we've got 12, yeah, we can um, run the two. So it's, I'll get hold of Pete and see if uh, he's up for sort of sort now. No, I, I think, you know, it's going to be, everybody's going to be so desperate to play that, um, you know, I think, Andy, you'll probably have to have a word with, maybe we can do a deal with um, with your firm. And um, there can be some sort of divorce lawyer um, commission because we'll all be like, going, I want to play every weekend. I want to go. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I've forgotten. I'm supposed to have a home life as well. But um, so no, that no, no, if you wouldn't mind a weekend in Bournemouth, it's just we, we've provisionally booked a week away in the middle of uh, August. So that will probably take out two weekends. So I suspect whatever weekend you end up annoying, uh, arranging it, I probably won't be available. But don't let that stop you. Well, it might be July. To be honest, it'll be sort of like you'll. The weekend that, sort of, that I'm going to try and do it is based around my boy's um, county game for cricket. Um, yeah. And when he's not going away for the weekend, that's when I'll probably try and when book is the, it. Um, so we just... Oh, sorry, the, the York thing is the, is the first weekend. York is after. the end of June, isn't it? Yes, yeah, the first weekend when we're supposed to be all allowed out, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a few of us already penciled in to go to that. Um, I think me and you, Dave, are, are on the list to, to drive up to the, the wilds and play in that slightly interesting only two armies of each type format event isn't it yeah mm. i'm using the wrong scale i'm using 18 millimeter mm. <laughs> have you decided which army you're going to try and claim or i've, I've, are claiming? Claimed, I've claimed um le- i mean i've got a very what i think is a very beautiful uh painted Legio heroica 
late Roman army. So a lot of the armies are gone by the time I chose mine. Hmm. The late Romans were still there, so I'm, I'm taking late Romans. Well, they're gone now. Can't have. You must have chosen the last one. Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. If I if I get to it, I'd probably go uh, with um, Thracian and possibly with an Imperial Roman ally. Because I, I suppose that will be hopefully after the new um, the new version of the rules comes out as well, won't it? So that some of those lists could change a little bit potentially. Has the release date for that been bolted on yet? Not yet. Not yet. It's not quite um, something. I've thought about taking the, my Frankish army from lockdown painting, and then I thought, Ugh. which one? Which Frankish army? You got so many. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I thought. Well, I could take. I could take the Franks. I've just painted them, and then I thought, oh god, it's not. Yeah, it's not a bad army. It's a bit like that Galatian army that I took down to Bournemouth um, yeah, a couple of years ago, isn't it? It's quite it's, effective. It's fun. It's more of a. It's more of a, a game. It's more of an army which fights against its own general. <laughs> so you've, got, you've got to make your army work. You know, the enemy doesn't actually count matter because it's you against your own army. Yeah, I it's might do another bib biblical army for um, the London GT. <laughs> Well, actually, are you doing, are you doing biblical in that theme, or is that Hubert? Um, Hubert, I think, is going to do the um, uh, step. And he's just desperate to avoid him, to be perfect. Yeah, honest. that's right. I <laughs> definitely am, yeah. I'm yeah. doing the biblical. Richard's already bagged the uh, biblical period in order to avoid. But, I mean, Inyaki's going to be taking Gaznavid on the steps. Yeah. Well, so yeah. Maybe some of these things will get changed or, yeah. or tweaked in... Um, in the new version, you never know. It might suddenly these might not be people might actually have to think about what they're taking, again, which would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? I've already kind of thought out my uh choice because it looks like uh, I'm playing in the step period, mm. so I've, I've already kind of thought out. So I tell you, go on, go well, on, then, Dave. The medieval Hungarian, where you that can sneak in an ally of German, of, Medi of, of uh, feudal German. So you can end up with 12 knights mm -hmm. when everybody else is using Mongols and... Yeah, no, it's like Hungarians and Germans are famous for being step-based empires. Yeah, exactly. The Teutonics were out there. Anyway, anyway so... Well, I, th I think it's it's a very brave choice, Dave, given the um, the list of armies which are allowed in that period hasn't been published yet. Yeah, but, um... it's on the website. Is it? Oh, right. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, it's, on, control it's on there. That. I thought I'm in control of that website. I didn't know it was actually still there. Might, might I guess? Okay. Actually, you know what, Tim? Actually, when you go online and go London GT teams or London mm. teams GT, the is Gaznavid there? Up, hang on. The first thing that comes up is the BHGS website. Well, that's one of only two places where it's actually listed. So um, that's probably quite good, really. That's I think that's the way internet search works, isn't it? You just need uh, to change the dates on the uh, BHS website. All right. What what do they say at the moment? They say the Friday Saturday. Oh, okay. All oh, right. So I'll, I'll have to, I'll go um, online and get the, that the fixed. The other army is, is, is basically, I mean, not taking Gaznavid and being dull and boring and using Inyaki's army. Hmm. Oh, and Tim, um, go yeah. on the website and change the list of allowed armies for the step-based one. Well, I, I was thinking <laughs> of that, but unfortunately I've... Um, in paint, I painted yeah, up a Hungarian army early yeah. earlier during lockdown, so <laughs> so I think that's quite unlikely that's going to fall out of the list, really, isn't it? Are you doing step-based? I don't know yet. Um, I've not really given it some thought. We probably need to have a chat with Rafa and, um, and see what he wants to do because he's really good. And um, so I think we should probably, on principle, just let him have first choice because um, he won't want to bring 25 mil. The Players can choose to commit to either attack or defend in the step. Right. There's something about terrain in the step. There's a bit more. You can have a rose or something, can't you? God, the hills well. cannot be combined with other terrain. <laughs> Possibly it's that's always it. good going. You have to have an on the step. Look, it's it's two years since we wrote those things, so um, they probably do need to checking, and it might change with them. Um, so I'm saying all these caveats. You never know what's going to actually come into um, into the new rules, do we? Really? Let's have a quick look at that when when then hopefully they come out in the foreseeable future. So, uh, so we'll yeah. have to try and get some more hints from Hervé about the uh, more lists and stuff. I think getting hints out of Hervé is is very very tricky. He he keeps a lot of stuff very close to his chest, very effectively. That's the secret. But but no, but it's great to be able to actually plan some events going forwards. Um, I think I'm 
I've accidentally bought some more um, Persian cavalry from um, Dave Allen secondhand. So I've got some more undercoating to do and some more shield transfer stickering to do. But but I think my week is just going to be finishing off hoplites probably for, for about the third, fourth week in a row or so it feels. Um, so Adam, are you going to stick the right um, stuff on the bottom of your bases? And, and when they're done, is it is it going to be full? Oh, no, that's, that's ship? done. It's done. To finish the army, all I've got is a full... Well, light horse, even though they're wearing yeah. armour, the four cav and the wagon to do. Um, so I'm hoping that, well, I say I'm hoping that'll probably be done this week. A week ago, I said it'll be two or three weeks. Um, it's my birthday tomorrow, so I'm not going to be overly enthusiastic about painting, but hopefully it'll be done in this week. But if not, it'll be the week after, and then I'm going to be doing some chips because um, it's like I'm getting sick of painting 28 mil figures, to be honest. Yeah, what chips? No, what, what era? Um, I'm glad. You should have done 25, Adam. No, no. well, this is the thing. <laughs> These are ships. So it's a, it's a bloody scale. The yep. one twelve fifty. okay? They are a scale. Naval war games can do scales. You've got one three thousand, one twelve fifty, one <laughs> six thousand. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not hard. Well, it's just That's easier to get the actual length of the ship and then divide it by a certain number. Yeah, it's easy to get the length of a man divided by a certain number. One seventy second, six foot one inch. There you go. Fish bosh. That's done. All right, so that's your week ahead. Um, Simon, what what have you got on your painting table, um, or, or painting or shopping plan? Sometimes. Uh, no shopping. I'm trying to be vaguely good. Uh -huh. um, it's all about Alexander the Greek and hop, um, hoplites. Excellent. So uh, Macedonian. You'd be very upset. Mm. Yeah, keep all of the Macedonians. Um, Dave, you sound like you're within touching distance of finishing these other guys, don't by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's still at least another two weeks. Uh, my, uh, my next week, hopefully, is dealing with job applications and job interviews. I'm in touching distance, you never know. Oh, good luck with that. Yeah. Good luck with that, yeah. Um, Andy, I think you've been saying that you're, um, is it finishing, will the finished skeletons end this week? Um, that, that that's optimistic. I reckon two two to three weeks, but possibly a bit less. I'd rather say two to three weeks, and then after that, I think I'll switch to something fifteen mil, possibly the Thracian cavalry, just in case I, I go to this York thing. Um, I did see something dropped into my inbox today, which was Osprey apparently are having a sale of a lot of their campaign books. I didn't look through it, but I just saw it existed, so I can share that with you guys if you're interested. Right, that's always worth having a look at. Yeah, worth look. Yep, yeah, yeah. Quick punt at those. All right, um, Tamsin. What about you? Will the um, will the six mil um, yeah, six rebels mil. be finished? Uh, for cavalry, yeah, I should should get those finished this week. This doesn't look as though there's going to be as many distractions. So have this. Yes. Yep. And that's uh, group draws you in to do some shopping. Yeah. Uh, so should get those done, and then it's just the odds and sods to do with the rest of it so some artillery some dismounted cavalry some limbers yeah, excellent stuff and um and peter you you gonna carry on hazaring or um is there something um, else or... yeah but a winged hazars i've worked out i've got 16 of them um that's not too bad is no. that 16 bases no 16 figures that's 16 it. horsemen that's, that's yeah that's, that's about the right five number, units isn't? five units in the commander how, yeah, have you managed to think. lose some since two weeks ago when we picked on you for having bought too many then? I thought I thought I got more. What's an acceptable number? Yeah, I thought I'd got more. So yep. I, I might have to go hunting, but at the moment I've got 16, unless they've gone walkabout. Um, you know, but, you know um, what's going to happen, guys? He's got, I've got 16 and they're going to paint them up in a month's time. He's going to say, oh, I found some more. Yes, I think that might no, be guaranteed. But then yep. um, it's sorted out about this biblical army for um, the GT one. Yeah, um because yeah. having a look at that because I, I might go and do some uh, um assyrians or something you some chariot purchasing <laughs> boring but have some chariot but if you have a chariot army you might as well have a chariot army so yeah well, you have the hebrews you have all sorts of fun fun allies with them you can have mesh fresh it's not selling the main army very well though andy is it really <laughs> the best thing about them is you can have the hebrews they're shit but they've got some yeah. nice friends they've got some great allies no you can afford like you, can, you can have i can have up to elite for eight heavy chariot impact of which four can be elite okay. that's like sounds, the 
biblical equivalent of, of, of knights. Uh, so is that what you're going to be playing then, Andy? Yeah. Sounds compelling. Definitely sounds compelling. All right then. So um, so I think with that, that that kind of fills us with with an agenda for the next week. So so we will um, sign off now, and we will return in a week's time with with the latest update and with the next um, ranty episode of um, I'm sorry, I think you're an arse and the answers to Andy's quiz. So goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. See ya. Alan once and we were playing at Burton and he came over and said I'm playing against a couple of blokes and one of them's getting their children to throw the dice which is fine you know what I mean if, if I was playing my boy was about or my girl was about I'd get them to throw the dice but he said they're actually having a conversation about the technique that they're practicing to throw six <laughs> Two of me. There is. He cloned himself and he's back again. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Where were we? What were you saying?